And so we're still in the book of Ephesians. We're halfway through, more than halfway through, praise God. Ephesians chapter 4. The, the important thing is, what are you getting out of Ephesians? So, Father, we ask for you. Oh, God, I ask for a spirit of revelation, enlightenment, and an impartation of love and truth for everyone here, that they would receive something from you that transforms their days and their lives. In Jesus' name. So we've been doing Ephesians now for some time. Ephesians chapter 1 is all about how you are in Christ. Beloved, you are the beloved. You are accepted in Christ. You are chosen in Christ. You're blessed in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 is about being ascended with Christ, who we once were, but now we are ascended. Uh, chapter 3 is about uh, the prayer, you know, the Father, Father in heaven, um, of a father of families in heaven and on earth. It's about knowing the love of Christ and experiencing the love of Christ. So the first three chapters of Ephesians is all about the wealth of who you are and what belongs to you in Christ in the kingdom. It's the most glorious book. Colossians is sort of like a partner with it. But Ephesians is glorious. It's like the pillars. You want to build your life, you want to build them on the pillars of the chapters of Ephesians. And, uh, and so what have you taken out of it? What have you taken from uh, Ephesians chapter 1 that talks about whether you're accepted in the beloved, whether you were chosen in him before the beginning of time? What is that one verse in Ephesians that's touched your heart? Or Ephesians chapter 2. Have you got the reality of the fact that you truly are now in the spirit realm, ascended with Christ in heavenly places? And that you can actually be seated with Christ and look down and see, see your life, see the earth from his perspective. Oh my gosh, how amazing is that? <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3, do you really know God as Father? Thank Abba, you. Abba, Abba God. Abba, Abba, whatever you want. Abba, whatever. Do you know him as Papa God, Daddy? Do you really know that you've been adopted into his family, accepted as one of his members of his royal household? So these things are really important because the word is to transform us. It's to change us. You having an encounter. Every time you open the word of God, you are having an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word of God. So every scripture should well, not every scripture, but the ones that impact you from the Holy Spirit, that's an open door into the realm of the Spirit because God is wanting to take you somewhere to experience something in the realm of the Spirit through the, the scriptural door of Jesus Christ. It's not just a revelation. Like we get a revelation and we think, oh, praise God, I've got a revelation. But then you've got to milk the revelation of everything in it so that it really becomes the word made flesh. So it's not just like a revelation. It actually changes the way you think. It changes the way you speak. It changes the way you walk and talk. It's got to be that so much of an encounter that it literally transforms you because we are changed in the presence of the Lord. And whenever you open the word, you are opening up an encounter with Jesus. And then we have... Chapters 4, 5, and 6, so chapters 1 to 3 are all, if you like, doctrinal, theological, whatever you want to call it, belief. This is what we believe. But then chapters 4, 5, and 6 is this is how we live, what we believe in chapters 1, 2, and 3. This is, the, this is the, what we believe. Now this is the practical outworking. And so he starts off by saying that we've got to walk worthy. Walk worthy. He's saying, okay, now put it into practice. This is where the rubber hits the road. Walk worthy. And um, the last Sunday I was here, Sunday before last, we looked at the fivefold team. You know, we've almost got it in open heaven. We're still needing an evangelist, although, Tara, you're coming close. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the apostle is the one that... Uh, the, the apostle is the one that, that actually governs. The prophet is the one that guides. The evangelist is the one that gathers. The pastor is the one that guards. And the teacher is the one that grounds people in the truth, not grinds them down, but grounds them in the truth. <laughs> so that's, that's basically what it is. It's just 
and, and, and apostles are to be a witness of the resurrection. You know, all through the, the New Testament, when the apostles testified, they testified of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he rose again from the dead. Do you really believe that? Yes. Then we should be like the happiest people on earth. You know, like the most blessed, happiest people. Um, the, the, the prophet guides and directs. So it's really funny. As an apostle, so just taking, setting up the chairs. Well, I just don't want the chairs set up. As an apostle, just set up the chairs. But then the prophets come and they say, well, we need to have, well, we can't have that number because that means this. And if you want it, we want it this way, we want it that way. So the prophets come and they pay attention to detail. Whereas the apostle is kind of like, just let's get this stuff done. We've got to move on, get it done. So the prophets come and say, well, we need it to think it this way. This is what's happening in the realm of the spirit. We need to work with it. So that's why the cornerstone of the church is Jesus Christ plus the apostles and the prophets. We need to work together. We need to have an understanding of how it flows. Like I said, when I was with Robert Henderson, the first time I saw it, I thought, doesn't this guy know how to run a meeting? Because I'm sitting there and he's up there and he's the apostle and he's saying, you know, leading the charge. This is what's happening. This is where we're going. And then Bev Watkins, for those of you who know Bev, she would stand up and she would take the mic and she'd say, this is what I see happening in the spirit realm. And then Robert would take the microphone off her and he'd, he'd sort of like pray that through or decree it or whatever. And then she'd take it back. And I'm thinking, what is going on? I've never seen this before. And I was kind of like, what have I walked into? But then the Lord spoke to me. He said, this is how apostles and prophets should be operating as one. Because I, I am not as sensitive to the realm of the spirit as a prophet. I know how to govern. I know how to lead the charge. I know how to get things done. But it's the prophets who come in and say, but this is what I see. This is what I hear. And so then we adjust the governance to that. That's why we work together. This is so important. So the, the fivefold is not for the, it, it's, we are just your servants. Fivefold are the servants of the body of Christ. We are here to make sure that you can are equipped to do the ministry. It's not about the fivefold doing the ministry. It's not our job. Ephesians chapter four says it's the work of the body of Christ. So let's just have a look at that. We're here to train you, grow you up, or whatever, um, teach you how it works. But in verse of chapter 4, verse 12, his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, that they would do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body. So it's not the fivefold who does the ministry, it's the body of Christ. Because you're out there where the unbelievers are. Mostly the fivefold are at conferences or in church meetings, but the body of Christ is out in the marketplace. They're in government, they're you know, in the schools, they're in arts and entertainment, they're, they're living their lives wherever God has positioned them. And that's where the ministry needs to take place, you know, to bring people to, to Christ, um, to heal, to deliver, to set them free, whatever it might be. It's out there in the marketplace. You know, most people would, would, would do rather anything than come to church. So when we send the body of Christ out, the world, the world is our mission field. So he says that we might develop, or his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints so that they would do the work of ministry toward building up Christ's body, that it would develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the knowledge of the Son of God, that we would arrive at a really mature manhood. Um, the Amplified says the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and the completeness found in him. We are to grow up the body of Christ, that you are complete in Christ. Remember in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul says, I travail until Christ is fully formed in you. Romans 8 says that we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. And here it says in Ephesians that we are to grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ. So as the fivefold... We are here to provide you with what you need. 
So if you tell me, I believe God is calling me to this and, uh, and I need this kind of equipping or I need this kind of training, then it's up to the fivefold to prepare that for you. We need to get you fully equipped to do what God has called you to do. It's not just, well, good on you. I'll commission you or pray for you and send you out there. No, we need to make sure that you are equipped with the best equipping we can give you so that you can take your rightful place. So this is what it's all about. And he says the reason for this is that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. Um, tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching, wavering with every, waving, every changing wind of doctrine, um, the prey of cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous people, gamblers engaged in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead anything to do with deception. So he's saying right now that we are to grow up into a oneness of faith. And you know what, if you look around at the body of Christ, we are so fragmented because our faith is in our doctrine. Our faith is in what we believe. Our faith is in the church we go to. Our faith is in whatever it might be, but it's not about that. Our faith is to be in Jesus Christ. If we want to do the works of that you know, it was to believe in Jesus. Our faith is to be in Jesus. And if we can come into agreement with that, we can do anything. It's not about, oh, my, my doctrine's correct. My belief is right. It's not about that. Jesus is perfect theology. When we come together around him, that's the oneness of faith. It's all about Jesus. And so when we, we believe what Jesus believes and we're conformed to his image, when we grow into the fullness of his stature and, and image, we are filled to the brim with Christ. I love that. I want to be so filled to the brim with Christ that I am overflowing, growing into the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so as you go through these, these things, what, what is it that you actually want to... You know, and so what Paul is, what, what, what is it that you want to take out of this? What is it that, that's sparking in your heart by the Holy Spirit? What is it that the Holy Spirit wants you to study out that he's saying, this is for you, take this, meditate on this, receive the revelation on this so you can be transformed in that? Paul is saying here in this letter, he's saying, body of Christ, we need you to grow up. We need you to stop being little children. We need you to take your rightful place in the realm of the spirit, the rightful place in life, and, and come to Jesus with a oneness and a maturity so that we can advance the cause of the kingdom upon the earth. Everybody's so quiet. Are you all okay? Oh my gosh. See, if there's no maturity, if we are not growing up in the things of God, we are vulnerable, like it says here in verse 14, we are vulnerable to the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous people. We are vulnerable to deception. We are vulnerable to being misled. We are vulnerable by a lack of discernment. Be blessed, Russell. So we, you know, so it's no longer like children tossed like tossed to and fro between chance gusts of teaching, wavering with every changing wind of doctrine, being misled by people. He says, "I need you to grow up so that you're stable, you're firm, you're in Christ. You, you're not going to be moved by this." Do you remember when Jesus was in the boat and there was a big storm, and it says he got up and he rebuked the wind, and then he said to the storm, "Shh, peace be still," or he said to the sea, "Peace be still." What he was doing, that was a meeting with a principality on that lake. And, uh, and what he, when he stood up and he rebuked the wind, he was rebuking the wrong doctrine. Like it says in Ephesians chapter 4 right there, between chance gusts of wrong teaching and, and false doctrine. Jesus was actually rebuking the false doctrine that came from the principality over that area. And then when he spoke to the sea, peace be still, he was actually speaking that to the people because the sea often, often represents people. And so you want to remember, if you're in a storm and you're feeling you're being buffeted about, how about taking authority over, over differing winds of, of doctrine? Any false beliefs that are there? and then speaking peace to the people in the situation. That's what Jesus did. But so often we just think, oh, well, it's a storm. But recognize if it's windy like that, like it says in Ephesians, it is false doctrine. It's wrong teaching. And sometimes that gets stirred up in us when God is wanting to show us truth. Mm -hmm. 
Truth is so important. And truth is all the way through Ephesians. We are to speak truly, deal truly, live truly, love truly. Love actually gives truth a voice. If we speak truth just out of truth, no love, there's no life. So it's recognising what kind of a storm are you going through? Are you feeling you're being buffeted about? Well, possibly there's some wrong doctrine there, false beliefs. Start taking the word of God. I hate to say this, but literally, maybe what it says is what it means. So I'm reading a book. I love African pastors. I have so many books by African pastors because they're just so in touch with the spirit realm that we're not in a certain way. And one of the books I'm reading on, on, a, on a mind, on the mind, deliverance of the mind, um, this pastor was saying that day to day utter speech, but night to night knowledge abounds. I think it's Psalm 19, but night to night knowledge. And he said, surely, it's like he's, surely. That means that you think at night, but you speak during the day because knowledge abounds at night. So he said, you do your thinking at night and then you can speak wisely during the day. And I went, I'd never have seen that in a million years. Right? Never would have seen that, but they take it so literally. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to do some shifting of some things. And instead of thinking about things during the day and, and God, what do I do with this and how, I'm going to do that at night when knowledge, night to night knowledge abounds so that I can speak wisely during the day. Isaac liked to meditate when dusk was there. You know, as the, at the fall of the day, Re Rebecca came to him and he was out in the fields meditating. That's a good time to meditate at that time. So start thinking about the watches and the times in the word. It opens things up. There's eight specific prayer watches in the Word of God. Each, each prayer watch means a specific thing. So I know when God wakes me up at midnight or he wakes me up to pray at three or four in the morning, I know what watch it is and I know what's expected of me. So, it's, you know, start to think about these things. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you the reality. But he's saying here that um, we can no longer be immature because when you're immature, life is out of control. Has anyone ever noticed that? If I don't handle my finances wisely as an adult, as one who knows the kingdom economics, my life is out of control with financial issues. And so um, we've got to recognize that, that sometimes we've really got to just grow up. So that was Mark 4.39 where Jesus rebuked the storm he rebuked the doctrine, commanded the sea to be still. And then he says also in, in things like this, there are cunning tricksters who are going to try and get you to do things that are not right or true. So I don't know about you, but I've been in other churches, big churches, where people would come in and they would be amazing people, almost like gifted and charismatic. And, and before long, they're on the, the leadership team. And before long, they're involved in this. And then all of a sudden, you find that nearly everybody in the church has been hit with, an, with a multi-marketing scheme. Or they've been hit with something else, you know. But I mean, I've been about four churches, big churches, and that's happened every time. So every time somebody new comes in and they rise quickly through the ranks, I hold my purse shut because I've been caught too many times. And so sometimes people see churches as a place to, to come and market their wares, which is what Paul is saying here in this one, beware of cunning men who come in through trickery. Right? Get false prophets like that. False prophets, false apostles, false teachers, you know? We had one amazing guy, had incredibly prophetic, accurate, at a church we were at, and uh, when we gave him the offering, he asked to be driven to the casino and promptly spent the offering at the casino. We were kind of like, oh. but that was up to God to sort out. He had already been talked to 
um, we were just unaware. Maybe the pastor hadn't done enough of the due diligence because every time you get somebody wanting to come and speak at the church, always ring at least three churches they've been to prior. Always ring because um, sometimes you can't, the, the, the ministry might be really good, but it's the fruit they leave behind. It's the fruit they leave behind. So what Paul is saying here is, you know what, guys, it's time to grow up. Because there's a call of God on your life. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord, walk worthy of him. <coughs> but in verse 15, it says, rather, let our lives lovingly express truth in all things. Let our life lovingly express truth. Not in a, I told you so, not in a shaking of the finger, not in a, although I do, you know, every now and again I do am challenged because I really want to say I told you so, but I can't do that. So, um, but, you know, he says you've got to speak truly, deal truly, enfold, it says in the Amplified, enfold it in love. Let us grow up in every way and in all things into him who is the head, even Christ the Messiah. Enfold it in love, grow up. Love, you know, and love is God. God is love, right? It says that God is love. You can go through the Bible and everywhere it says God, you can put the word love and it makes sense. In the beginning, love created the universe. In the beginning, love created heaven and earth. You know, God's God said, love so loved the world that he sent his only son. And so recognizing that love is absolutely everything to do with Jesus because he came to set right what the devil set wrong. And it's all to do with love. But we don't really understand what love is. It's sacrificial. It's wanting only the highest and the best for the people involved. It's unconditional. It is faithful regardless of how faithless the other people are. It is agape, God's love. And he's saying we are to live a life enfolded in this kind of love. And when you speak truth, it's got to be done in love. So I struggle with this because sometimes apostolically, I just want to say it like it is. I just want to let rip. But I can't because it's got to be enfolded in love. Because it's actually love that gives truth a voice. So everybody, we've all heard truth, right? Has anyone heard truth that has not been wrapped in love? Yes. Have you felt like you've been hammered? And like, well, I don't care if that's the truth. I don't want to touch it with a barge pole because of the way it was delivered. It hurts. I hope that's not me. <laughs> Could be me. No. So it's recognizing that that everything is, is is about love. It's about love giving truth a voice. We're enfolded in love. And love and truth together bring an atmosphere. It brings an atmosphere that's conducive to change. And when you when you combine love and truth, growth is inevitable. You mature when that. It's spontaneous. Truth is integrity to love. And love is an attraction to truth. If I know somebody loves me, I will listen to the truth they have to say, even if I don't want to hear it. Like when my grandson told me the other night that I had relapsed. I had bought a packet of potato crisps. I was tired. It was a habit. I admit wrong, right? It was a habit. But I bought the potato chips and I'm sitting there enjoying my comfort food. And he says, you've relapsed. But because we have an atmosphere of love in the house, Man, was I convicted. <laughs> so it's, it's recognising that, that truth and love, when they come together, it brings an atmosphere. But truth alone brings a different rigidity. It brings a legalism. It brings a harshness. And we say that truth brings freedom, but really truth needs to be married to love in order for us to apply that. So this is so important. Truth is the integrity to love. And love brings attraction to the truth. And who is the truth? Jesus. Verse 14, it says, um, where are we? 16. For because of him, the whole body, all the church, 
closely joined and firmly knit together by joints and ligaments with which it is supplied when each part grows to full maturity, building itself up in love. You could go through chapter four, you can underline love and truth. It's there all the way through. But he's saying right here, because of Jesus Christ, the whole body is joined and knit together and we've got to, every part's got to supply its part. That's why open heaven, we need people here who will add their, you know, that we get all the limbs and the joints and everything will be knit together so that we become whole and everything becomes one. So the body of Christ actually must throb with the energy of love. It must be mature. We have got to mature. And he says, if you do this, then there's going to be a very separate definition to the way the world lives. If you do this, speaking the truth in love, if you let love enfold your life, if you do this, you'll be very different to the world. And so in chapters and verses... 17 to 19 it says so this i say and solemnly testify in the name of the lord that you must you must no longer live as the heathen do in their per, in their perverseness in the folly vanity and emptiness of their souls and the futility of their minds their moral understanding is darkened their reasoning is beclouded they are alienated, estranged, and banished from the life of God. They have no share in the life of God. And this is because of the ignorance, the want of knowledge and, and, um, and perception, the willful, willful blindness that is deep-seated in them due to their hardness of heart, due to the in insensitiveness of their moral nature, in their spiritual apathy. Who knows, this isn't just Gentiles. Who also can be spiritually um, apathetic? I know I have at times. I've been, I have been, I have had a spiritual apathy, where it's sort of like, oh, I just can't be bothered. It's too hard. My prayers are hitting the ceiling. I might as well just curl up under Maduna. We all at times suffer with a spiritual apathy, and he says, but in their spiritual apathy, they've become callous and past feeling and reckless. They've abandoned themselves to unbridled sensuality, eager and greedy to indulge in every form of impurity that their depraved desires may suggest and demand. And then he says in verse 20, but you did not learn Christ like that. That's right. You did not learn Christ like that. So we've actually got to move away from the futility of the mind, from living life in a meaningless way, from darkened minds and hardened hearts. And who knows that even Christians can have a darkened mind. Even Christians can have a hardened heart, a conscience that has been seared, that really, you know, like I'm, I'm happy to let God in this far, but I don't want to let him in any further. I don't want God to touch this part because it hurts. Just stay out there, God. Stay in the parameters because I've got free will and I'm just letting you in here, but I'm not letting you have all of it. You know, it says that the, uh, the God of this world blinds the minds of the unbelievers. Well, there are Christians who also unbelieve. Healing's not for today. All, all the, all, everything's ceased, you know, all the, all the gifts have ceased, cessationalism, all of that. Their minds have been blinded by the God of this world. So all because we're Christian, how mature are we? Right? How mature are we? Have we really given ourselves totally to Christ? Or are we Christian in name? Or are we Christian as long as it's comfortable and it's not... You know, doesn't hurt too much because, hey, I really like my way it is. And, and if Jesus is calling me to go to Uganda, you know, like, I'm not really sure I want to go. And so we've got all these things in us, you know, and, and we, we've got guards up around our hearts and our minds without even realising what we keep God out of. And it's only when he gets our attention that we think, oh, oh, I didn't realise. I've got a client at the moment, a businessman who has just been... His business has kind of come groundingly, grindingly to a halt. And he said to me in his last email, I think God has stood me down. And so um, we're going to do a Zoom and see what needs to be resurrected or rededicated to Christ or what area has not been opened. But he's recognised it hasn't been the devil that's done it. God's actually done it because there's something in him that's not prepared to go any further. And there's a call of God on his life to affect nations through business. So you know what? We, we, in Australia, it's really easy to think we're a good Christian, right? 
But now with the new legislation in Queensland, it might be a little bit of a challenge because when we, you know, there's whatever they call the new, the new law is that's just been passed, um, anybody can be offended by anything. And, you know, before you know it, you are being, are we allowed to say the word re-educated? <laughs> but so there's things that are changing very rapidly. So the body of Christ has to grow up in this nation. We have to recognise that we are in a spiritual war and it's a war for this nation, but it's a war that Jesus Christ has won. That we have to take our place. And, you know, quite honestly, I can be talking to somebody and I have no idea that what I've said has offended them. Because I don't give offence. Offence is taken. It's taken. So I, if, if I had known it would offend them, I wouldn't have said it. Or I maybe would have phrased it in a different way or pre-framed it or something. But quite often I have no idea that I have offended anybody until they let me know. And so with this new legislation, it's all about feelings. Right? And then you've got the, the new thing that Alban, uh, our Prime Minister wants to bring in about the misinformation bill. That's back on the table. So, uh, you know, it's an interesting time to be a Christian, but it's also an interesting time to have a business because it can, anybody can say anything in the business world and people will be offended and, and take you to court or whatever it is that they take you to. So it's just a whole different realm and so we have to actually recognise what's going on in the realm of the spirit and say, you know what, it's not going to shake me. I will continue to speak the truth because it's only the truth that brings freedom to people, but I will ensure that it's wrapped in love. It's a different season. It's a different season when your own government is stripping away free speech and telling you what you can and cannot think. It's a different season. And so we need to understand what Ephesians is all about because Ephesians ends with spiritual warfare. But Paul is saying in this letter, you can't go into warfare until you know the wealth, until you know who you are and what you have in Christ. Ephesians 1 to 3, you've got to know that. Then he says in, in chapters 4 and 5, in the first 10 verses of chapter 6, you've got to know how to walk this out in your daily life because if you walk it out according to what is in the scriptures, you will be protected. But if, you go, if I go to war and I don't know who I am in Christ, I guess it can be beaten up. If I go to war and I know who I am in Christ, I know the wealth I have in Christ, but I have not walked it out the right way in relationships or, or in that way because it deals with family relationships, work relationships. If I have not walked it out appropriately and I go to war, guess who gets attacked? So it's recognising I've got to know who I am. I've got to have the walk right so that then I can go to war and be victorious without backlash, without counterattack. This is why the, this book of Ephesians is so important. And he's saying, I need you to grow up because there's a lot of false doctrine out there. There's a lot of people willing to deceive out there. There's a lot of um, people in the world that, that need to know about Jesus Christ. But I tell you what, their, their minds are darkened, their hearts are hardened, their consciences are seared. But in, and you were once like that, but you haven't learned Christ like that. So, you've got, so he's saying, make sure there's a purity in the way that you walk. Make sure there's an innocence in the way you carry yourself. You know, like ensure that you come back to Jesus in everything because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And so if he is the way, you say, Jesus, would you please show me the way. Jesus, would you show me the truth in this situation? Jesus, be the life in this situation. He is the way, the truth and the life. But we cannot be like the world. And so there's some responsibilities here. He says, we've got to put away some things. We've got to put off some things and put on some things. And these are things that God does not do for us. The Holy Spirit does not do for us. Jesus doesn't do for us. These are responsibilities that Paul is laying out that this is what we must do for ourselves. And so we've got to recognise this is part of maturing, part of being responsible, part of growing up so that we can take our place in the, in the, and be what God wants us to be. So we can't be blinded by the senses. We can't be stubbornly wearing a blindfold. 
We can't have a calloused heart. We can't give in to lust and greed. We can't be abandoned to outrageous and shameful living. We can't, you know, we have got to be allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives with the truth. And Jesus is the truth. So whatever is said of Jesus is actually what Jesus wants said of you. Because don't we represent him? Isn't Christ to be fully formed in us? Didn't we die with him? And it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. So therefore, what is spoken of Jesus, Jesus wants spoken of us. Jesus is not an example for us. He is an example of us. This is what we will look like when we are fully conformed to his image. This is how we will live. You are one with him, but we need to allow him to take the, the rightful place. So in verses 22, it says, I, I want you to strip yourself of your former nature. He says, put off the old man, which characterized your previous manner of life and, become, and became corrupt through lusts and desires that sprang from delusion. Be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. He says, I want you to have a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. I don't want you to be familiar. I don't want you to think, well, this is what it was like. This is how the anointing worked last week, so it's got to be the way it works this week. He's saying, I want you to have a fresh mental and spiritual attitude because quite often we become very stagnant spiritually. We can be aware that we've got to renew our mind, but spiritually we become very familiar with what we know works. And we don't allow ourselves to open up to new weapons, new tools, new revelations, new impartations, new anointings, things that God wants to do because, hey, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is how it is. No, that's not the truth. And so he's saying you've got to put this off. You've got to, you've got to strip yourself of your old nature. God will not do that for you. Holy Spirit will help if you ask, but this is your responsibility. And then he says, and you've got to put on the new. Take it off and put it on. It's like a wardrobe. Strip off the carnality and put on the spirituality. Strip off the flesh and put on the spirit. Strip off your past experiences and put on the truth of God's word. The number of Christians that use their experience to describe the word instead of realizing maybe I just had a lousy bad experience right I just had a bad experience it's nothing compared to what the word of God says you know people pray for people for healing uh, and people die oh well it must have been God's will no no it is not God's will for somebody to die before their age is up, their 120 years or whatever. You know, it's not God's will. 70 years was man's thing. 120 years is God's thing. But it's not God's will. When the disciples couldn't get rid of the, um, you know, the kid that kept having the, the seizures, and, and Jesus said to them, oh, you unbelieving, perverse generation. How long have I got to put up with you? That word unbelieving, we understand. But do you know what perverse means? Perverse means you are prepared to leave it the way it is, even though it is not the will of God. They were prepared, the disciples were prepared to leave that little boy the way he was, rather than continue to persevere until he was delivered and set free. And so this perverseness is when we, we ex well, there's nothing I can do. I prayed about it, but nothing happened. It's just going to, that's, and so we leave it the way it is instead of continuing until it's transformed to the will of God. That's perverse. And he's saying, I will not have perverse disciples. I will not have unbelieving disciples. And when he said, this, this type only goes out by prayer and fasting, he was not referring to the demon. He was referring to their unbelief. And the spirit of perverseness that allowed them to leave that little boy in the shape he was in. And I know for myself, there have been some areas in my life where I have been perverse. Where I have prayed for my sister-in-law who had that massive stroke and, and we know, and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and then and nothing really changed, nothing changed. She was still, oh, so much. less than what God intended but in the end I kind of I kind of gave up and it was kind of like oh God just bless her 
help her, help my brother. But I, I prayed and prayed and prayed and hope deferred makes the heart sick. But, you know, it's like I can't see prayer making any difference. I couldn't reconcile it with God's will, but I, I could no longer knew how to pray. I didn't know what to do about it. So in that way, I was perverse because I allowed that to, I, I, I let it camp me. Instead of propelling me on, instead of pushing me into seeking God with fasting and prayer or whatever, I allowed it to let me camp in a place that was not good for her and was not good for me. So we've all had areas, I think, where things have been overwhelming and we've kind of allowed it to settle us in a certain way. And if we don't, if we don't push through by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're allowing a spirit of perverseness. And none of us want that. But that's what it's talking about when it says that. And so Paul's saying here, you've got to make sure you get rid of all of the old stuff. Get on a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. And who knows, sometimes that fresh mental and spiritual attitude has to be a daily walk. Because sometimes yesterday was really hard. Oh, I don't want another day like yesterday, <laughs> right? Get rid of it. Get rid of the old, put on, a, put on the new. But this is what he's talking about. This is your responsibility. This is not something that God will do for you. And I don't know how many Christians have said, oh, well, God will do it. No, he won't. He provided everything through Jesus. He, he provides the power of the Holy Spirit. But there are some things we have to do for ourselves. Otherwise, we don't grow up. So he says, I want you to put off the old. Put off the stuff that, that tears you down, that binds you down, that grinds you down. Put it off. Get a fresh mental and spiritual attitude and put on the new. Put on the new, which is created in the knowledge of the truth. So it says that in um, verse 24, put on the new nature created in God's image in true righteousness and holiness. So put on the nature created in God's image. Put on that. And therefore he says, reject all falsity, being done with it. Let everyone express the truth with his neighbour, for we are all parts of the body, members of one another. Speak truth. And then he says... And we might finish with this. When angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, your indignation last until the sun goes down. Because when you do that, you give a foothold to the devil. It is a, an open door. He's saying that you've got to remain fully immersed in Christ. The, the thing is, this is the fascinating thing with being a Christian, is that you are dead and alive at the same time. Now, I'm dead. I'm crucified with Christ. But, oh, hey, wait a minute. I'm alive with the resurrection life and power, and it's now Christ who lives in me. So we've got this dichotomy, this, this separation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a spiritual being, but, oh, my gosh, my flesh still has a loud voice. My mind has been renewed to the mind of Christ. It's us being transformed. However, the part of it that's unrenewed. So we have this, this dichotomy, this pull all the time and as we continue to grow and to mature in the things of God. But he's saying here, you've got to put on the fact that you were created in the image of God in true righteousness, holiness of the truth. One thing I loved about Singapore was that the Singaporean people that I mixed with, man, their minds were so aligned with the truth. They could pull scripture out of any book of the Bible and just, you know, speak it into a situation. They were amazing. It wasn't about what they felt. It wasn't about what they thought. It was all about Christ. It was all about Jesus. It was all about the truth of the word of God and how they had to adapt to it, conform to it, be shaped by it, be immersed in it, love it, allow God to do whatever he wanted to do. They had just such a surrender to the truth of the word of God, to love and truth. And it was just amazing. They really knew how to put off so I have a client, a European client, who is um, awesome. But when we first met, had a very 
strict view of God. You did what he said. Yeah, you do what he said. So it took a little bit to talk, bring him around to a father. Well, he's your father. But every time I brought out something different to him than what he was used to, he would say, wait. Yeah, got it, move on. But he would, you know, he would process something immediately and then if he got it, he got it and, and he, would, he would adapt his life accordingly. If he couldn't get it, it was like, okay, discussion time. But how, how in, and, and the word probably is wrong, but how intense are you to allow Christ to be fully formed in you? Because there are times when it's painful. And I have to face up to the fact that I've made some personal vows. I will never go to Uganda again. <laughs> repented, repented. Um, but we make vows. I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to put myself in, in that kind of a position again. I'm never going to do that again. We make these vows. But what we're saying in those vows is that Jesus Christ cannot protect us. So we're going to protect ourselves. That has to come down. Every false vow or every vow that we've ever made that has been for self-righteousness, self-protection, self-whatever, it has to go because it's not made in the image of God. We're actually saying, God, I don't trust you in this area. I don't trust you to look after me. I don't trust you to protect me. I don't trust you to keep me safe. But he says here in Ephesians, you've got to put all that off. Renew a fresh mental and spiritual attitude and put on the new. Put on Christ. Be fully clothed in Christ. In case you're not aware, judgment has come to the house of God. Yes. We can see that with the ministries overseas. Ministries that are falling. Or they're trying to whatever, whether they're trying to keep the ministry and the church going and getting rid of whoever. But judgment has come to the house of God. So the thing is, we have a choice to change before judgment hits open heaven <coughs> and every other church in Australia because it's coming. And we, this is where, you know, like, and I'm not speaking, like, I'm not speaking fear. I'm just saying, oh, gosh, guys, get yourself right with God. Yeah, That's all I'm saying. Please get yourself right with God. Get your life right with Christ. Whatever little petty sins we've got going on, get rid of it. If you're not living the fruit of the Spirit, change. If you're trusting in yourself for certain areas, let go, let God. All I'm saying is allow Christ to be fully formed. Because there's lots of churches in America that have passed the judgment test. There's some that haven't. And of course, the ones that haven't, they're always the ones that make the news. But God, it, or the judgment always starts in the house of God first. Then it moves to nations. This is a serious time. This is a serious time. And it's a good time. That's why we're pushing Ephesians, because we are going to be adding into a spirit of spiritual warfare, whether you like it or not. And it's not just open heaven. It is the body of Christ that will be moving into it, which is why I want to have you fully prepared, fully armoured, fully equipped, strong in Christ, being able to stand in him, knowing the truth, knowing your wealth, knowing how to walk it out, knowing how to war. Because the thing is, you've got to wrestle only once, and the rest of the time you've just got to learn how to stand. Right? We don't wrestle with these things, with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. But all of the time, it's like, stand, 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 stand. So there's a season coming that I want you prepared for. Yes. And I don't want you frightened by it. I don't want you to worry about it. I just want you to be prepared for it. Because if you're prepared for it, it's easy. Or easier. Right?
So recognise there's a season coming I want you ready for. This is, this is it, I just need you prepared. Be prayerful, be alert, be watchful. Um, know the truth. Know the truth of God's word. And make sure that all of the carnality and the flesh and all of that is gone and that you are fully immersed in Christ and Christ is fully immersed in you and you just know how to flow with him because your spirit's one with the Holy Spirit. So the beautiful thing is, like in 9-11, um, like with some of the terrorist activities and stuff like that, there were so many Christians who were warned. Don't go there. They were late for work or they, you know, uh, when they, there was a, a terrorist attack, I think in Indonesia somewhere, somewhere over there some, some years ago, number of Christians would have been in that place, but they just thought, oh, you know what? Oh, I left something in my room. I just need to go up and get it. One of them just thought, oh, I'm uncomfortable where I am. I'll just go and stand near that pillar. And that protected her during the blast. So many testimonies came out. So the thing is, if you are in Christ, if you're listening to him, if you're being led by the Holy Spirit, all is good. Right? All is good. And you can go to war and you're safe and you're protected and everything is okay. But it's when we've got that bit of a flesh, when we're thinking, oh, you know what, I just... I ask the Holy Spirit, which I don't always find comforting, comfortable, but I ask the Holy Spirit, where am I? What is it in me that needs to be shifted? Like, like almost like, and I'm not doing Scientology, but almost like do an audit on me. Show me where I need, well, show me what I need to know about myself so that I can continue to grow in Christ the way that God wants me to. So put off, put away, get a fresh mental and spiritual attitude and put on Christ. Yes. Take your rightful position in life, in the body of Christ and everything. Let me tell you why, and, and I said I'd finish with this, but I'm going evangelistically, so I must be, Come this on. is it. But let me tell you why you should not allow anger in your house you know like anger righteous anger is one thing but anger with one another don't let it don't let the sun go down let me tell you why because anger breeds and let me tell you what it breeds if you go down to verse um, so verse 26 when angry don't sin don't let your wrath last until the sun goes down. Verse 27, leave no room or foothold for the devil. Give him no opportunity. Then he says, let the thief steal no more, but let him be industrious, making an honest living. And then he says, this is what anger leads to. And this is the amplified. Let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth. So who knows when you're angry, all of that stuff comes out of our mouths. He said, but only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others as is fitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace and God's favour to those who hear it. And then he says, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit because if we move into this kind of anger, we grieve the Holy Spirit. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't offend him. Don't sadden him. Because by the Holy Spirit, you were sealed. You were marked. You were branded as God's own. You were secured for the day of redemption, um, of final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. And then he says, and this is the fruit of anger. Let all bitterness, indignation, wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, resentment, anger, animosity, quarrelling, brawling, clamour, contention and slander, evil speaking, abusive or blasphemous language be banished from you with all malice, spite, ill will or baseness of any kind. That all comes out of anger. You allow anger to come, you get bitter. There's that bitter root of judgment that comes in. You get, you get angry, then you get passionate, you get full of rage and bad temper. Then there's resentment and anger and animosity. Quarrelling starts up, slander. You start speaking wrong things about people because you're looking at them through the perspective of anger. And he says, and then there's all sorts of abusive speech. There's abusive um, language, blasphemous language and malice because all of a sudden we want to get even. We want to show them who's boss. That all comes out of anger. He says, and I wonder, he says, to put things off so you can put on Christ. 
And then in verse 32, and then he says, this is, this is how you're supposed to live. Become useful, helpful, kind to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted. This is the Amplified. Forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiving readily and freely. Be kind, compassionate, helpful, understand, loving-hearted. He said there's a complete contrast here. So you choose what you put on and what you take off. You choose. This is the time to grow up. Jesus said that when the world sees us, what is it, loving one another, as he loves us, the world will know. The world will know that he is God. Maybe the reason that some of our family members, maybe, have not come to Christ is because they haven't seen Christ in us. They might have seen judgment. They might have seen anger. There might be splashes of Christ and splashes of anger, splashes of acceptance, splashes of judgment. I don't know about you, but I know I don't walk in Christ 100%. I don't walk in Christ 24-7. On the, on the journey, because it's a, it's a process, isn't it? We've got to learn to allow, to, to what it means to be led by the Spirit, what it means to, what do you mean, speak the truth in love? Can't I just tell them what I think? I lovingly tell them what I think, tell them the truth. I really love them, they're my family, I love them, but, you know, let me just tell them the truth. There's a whole different way of living. And none of us have got our act together. None of us are 100% there. But we're all on a journey. The big thing that God is looking for and the world is looking for is that Christ is fully formed in us. That we are conformed to his image and we're growing into the fullness of the stature of Christ. That's key. That's key. So no anger. No resentment, no bitterness, no ill will. No, I told you so's. None of that. I am learning, I won't say I have learned, man, because I'm learning that when someone in my family does something and I really want to say something, I shut my mouth and go to my room and pray. Take it to God, deal with it with him, and then if he opens the door, I might say something. But if he doesn't open the door, I ain't going where angels fear to tread. I am waiting for the Holy Spirit to lead me. So in this season, I want to encourage you as well. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You need to know what grieves the Holy Spirit. It was all those anger sins that were listed there. But I think we need to know who the Holy Spirit is. Just start asking, Holy Spirit, will you bring me into a relationship with you? That I truly know you. That I'd know you the way you are. You know, he's the spirit of war. He's the spirit of grace. He's the spirit of peace. He's the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of Christ. Spirit of truth and spirit of love. He's represented as the oil, the wine. Yeah. Get to know the Holy Spirit. Get to know him because it's his leading that's going to keep you protected. Okay. So, glory to God. Oh. On that happy note. Oh, <laughs> oh glory to God. Mm -hmm. Oh, glory to God. Just encourage you, if somebody comes to mind, pray for them. There's people, you know, going through stuff. If somebody comes to mind, pray for them. Reach out if the Holy Spirit tells you, but pray for them.